Good afternoon and welcome to Scotland's Foraging Festival Online. My name is Heather Woodbridge and I have the pleasure to be hosting this session from Orkney today. Um, this, this event is called the Foraging the Old Road. A foraging fortnight is a celebration of Scotland's natural environment and wild food. It is supported by leader funding and by Nature Scott, formerly Scottish Natural Heritage. Once again, the Foraging Festival is part of the Orkney International Science Festival, and this year we are delighted to bring a full festival programme directly to you wherever you are at this moment. So today, Foraging the Old Road, we will be walking through Binscarth Woods and over the hill to the Loch of Wasdale. And you may have noticed I have two fabulous speakers. I'm joined here today by Anna Canning and Shimon Shistachevich. So I think Anna's joining us from Edinburgh and Shimon's joining us from Poland. Hello. Hi Hello. there. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm not in Poland at the moment. I'm in Scotland as well. Oh, me. Oh, I do apologise, Shimon. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So I'll just um, introduce you both to our audience. Um, Anna, uh, joining us, is a qualified medical herbalist with a career in clinical practice as well as freelance translation. Um, now her focus is on education and research, using her expertise to promote sustainable plant-based self-care in the community by running courses and workshops for adults and children. And Shiman is an environmental biologist um, with a lifelong interest in foraging. Great. It's fantastic to have you both here. Great. How are you both doing? Good, thanks. Yeah, great to be here. Well, virtually in Orkney rather be there live but <laughs> in person I believe it's quite sunny there today so but um great to be there virtually mm. well thank you I'm uh, I'm here in sunny Musselburgh which is very ah. well but uh, a bit further away excellent yeah okay dokie well, we're going to have a film shown to us very shortly, but after the film, there's an opportunity for live questions for both of our speakers. And I believe that Anna has put together some notes and recipes for the walk, which uh, with a link to the route map for you to download and take with you. So you can find that on the Orkney International Science Festival website if you want to have a look at that. And so if you do have any questions for our speakers, please enter them into the YouTube live chat and we'll come back to these at the end of the talk. But we hope you enjoy the virtual outing today. Thank you, and I'll, I'll hand over to yourself, Anna and Schumann. Great. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed, Heather. And um, we're looking forward to seeing the film, um, beautiful Orkney landscapes, and um, looking forward to meeting all the participants and hearing your questions as well. So let's take a wee look at the film. So welcome to the foraging walk in Orkney today. Um, we're starting in a bit of a noisy place. We've got cockerels and we've got traffic here. Um, we're going to be walking part of the St Magnus Way today. So starting here in the village, um, walking up to Binsgarth Woods. We'll go through the woods. We'll have a look at what plants and things are around and then up to Loch of Wasdale, uh, where you get some lovely flowers, hopefully some wildlife and some nice views. Um, here we've got some elder, so we've got the elder flowers here and I'll be telling us a bit more about the different ways that you can use them. Simone, here's another of my favourites. Mm -hmm. I think you like this one too. Oh yes. Uh, elder, mm -hmm. elder tree. Steeped in lower and superstition, native to most of northern, the northern hemisphere. Um, fantastic for food and medicine. Mm -hmm. Elders, Sambucus nigra, or Sambucus mm -hmm. nigra, Sambucus mm -hmm. black elder, mm -hmm. it's all often referred to. Yeah, so this is a typical elder leaf. 
Um, it's This is a single leaf with five leaflets, a compound leaf, and sometimes you get seven, but this is more usual. So here is some of the flowers are open already and some of them are still in bud form. And here you've got still a flower head that's just budding. How beautiful it is to, to watch all that plant releasing the pollen like that. <laughs> you see, and all this, it's flavor and it's medicine. So if you'll be making cordial that you've mentioned, this is what you want to extract, yeah. is this pollen. I mean, it's, I, we don't yet know exactly why elder is so effective. Mm -hmm. The berries are also a very traditional winter tonic. Mm -hmm as an antiviral for colds mm -hmm. and flu and there's been some research done on that mm -hmm. and one of the viruses that one of the virus family that elder is very effective against is coronavirus mm -hmm. now that's not to say that it's not yet known whether it's effective mm -hmm. for the current COVID-19 um, virus this thing makes the most wonderful champagne yeah. and wine to make wine and to make champagne very easy could use a uh, champagne yeast or yeast just uh, uh, wildly like a wild yeast present on the flowers and you would steep that that in a in a water sugar and water extract the pollen and then ferment it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you yes. need to let your process right so i would advise you to go into into a books online or or or, or during mm -hmm. one of the courses uh, to learn how to do it unless you know how to do it beautiful great idea Winscars Woods is a really popular area for uh, locals to come, families with kids like to come, uh, lots of dog walkers. It's also one of the, the few woodlands that you'll see in Orkney and it's quite a big one at that. It's lovely in the springtime when you've got a bit less canopy to really see the different birds and hear the different bird song. If you can get up early enough for the dawn chorus, it is amazing. I never manage that. <laughs> Even at this time of year though, if you look up, there's lovely um, light shining through the leaves and the canopy at this time of year. And here's a robin singing for us and some gold crest behind us. You get gold crest here, uh, robins, blackbirds, wrens, wood pigeons, coloured doves probably as well. There'll no doubt be a few sparrowhawks around, uh, which will take the smaller birds for prey. I'm often asked why there's not many trees in Orkney. Wind, <laughs> the weather, an art name, the wind. Um, I guess like you need a lot of shelter for the trees to go. As I know in my garden, we've only got to a certain height after 11 years. <laughs> Here we've got some pink purslin. Um, so it seems to really like kind of woodland shady areas. Um, really pretty little pink flower. Um, you sometimes see it white, as kind of white versions of it as well. It seems to flower for quite a long time. I'm sure I was starting to see it around March time when we went into lockdown and I've seen it out on my local patch box. Um, it's still in flower now, it's really pretty. Here we've got some dead man's fingers. So they seem to like growing on bits of dead wood like this. Um, I don't know much about fungi, but this is one of the few ones I know that's stuck in my head. A nice bunch of nettles here. You can get quite a nasty sting off them, but you'll usually find some dockins close by to, to relieve the sting. Nettles can be used for a variety of different things. You can make a soup with them, you can make a nettle pesto with them, and I'll be able to provide some tasting notes for them. They're also really good for wildlife. They provide early cover for uh, migrating birds that come here to breed, like the corncrakes. So they, they put up uh, natural corridors at a lot of the RSPB reserves to try and encourage the corncrakes back. The flowers in the spring also attract a lot of insects. Here we've got the, the hawthorn hedging. Um, we've just missed the flowers, we're a bit late for them, but the, some of the berries are just starting to form here. So there is a saying um, which goes, Neer class ta clout till may is out, which means don't put your winter woolies away until the mayflower is out. So hello Lauren. Hello Anna. It's a lovely day to be out and about doing some foraging. Absolutely, yeah. And I see what we've got here, we've mm. got some a lovely hawthorn bush. Yeah. 
that's very distinctive leaves. So this is something you can find pretty much all over Britain and I know there's plenty in Orkney as well. So will you tell us a wee bit more about it, you know, how yeah. to identify it and yeah. what it can be used for? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, in fact, being this close, first of all, and the, the, the keys in the name as well, there, there are thorns, so do, do look out for the thorns and be careful. Um, so, yeah, you'll see that there's thorns all over. Um, and, and to pick up on what you said there about the leaves, they are quite distinct. And if you, um, basically they have these really obvious lobes and they're quite a small leaf. You know, that's a larger one uh -huh. there. Yep. So um, if you get your eye in there, you know, you once you see it, you sort of, it's, you don't really mistake it, you know, um, yeah. so that again, the leaves are quite obvious. And there's nothing else that's, that's really like it that you well, could mistake yeah, it for. Decoy, yeah, absolutely. So, um, certainly those two things. And of course, the lovely um, haws or berries themselves. Mm -hmm. um, being a member of the rose family, actually, at the minute they're looking a little bit like little, little apples. They so are, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So these little green berries are the, the haws and they will turn red as they get a bit more sun and get larger. And that's when you want to harvest them, maybe in autumn time. Um, when the, the flesh is sort of, you know, much more um, fuller and, and riper. So at mm. the minute do not pick them, but yeah, that's another key ID feature mm -hmm. for the hoss. And so it's, it's got a long tradition of use, hasn't it? Um, I know some in some places they call it bread and cheese. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So some, especially in springtime when the new little leaves have just come out, they're, they're very delicate and quite fresh and tasty. So, um, so kids, even in the past and adults like myself and yourself um, you can just munch it straight off the off the, the, the tree Absolutely. you know it's very very tasty mm -hmm. um, bread and cheese is it really yeah 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 lovely and it's just also got lots of folklore and superstition and all that sort of thing but it's also a useful medicine isn't it yeah yeah a quick bit of folklore is um the the, the hawthorns associated with the, the may queen um, you know, kind of, um, and the, the, the fairies um, in, in other realms. So, um, you know, in a midsummer's evening, actually, if you're around the Hawthorn tree, watch out because you might be sort of ca captured and taken away by the, 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 the May Queen and all the all the, all the fae. Yeah. So, um, the, the, the wee folk are mm -hmm. very much associated with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, as you mentioned, and it's a beautiful one actually, and that's reflected in that redness and the richness of the berries as well. For me, is um, that, that heart medicine? It's a heart and circulatory tonic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tonic just meaning it really supports and and nourishes, you know. Um, so um, it really helps with the circulation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But it's also good for blood pressure. So it balances blood pressure. Yeah. Um, you can take it as a tea. So the leaf and flowers, or yeah. the berries in the autumn. Um, and there's foods you can make with it as well. But we're going to put together some more information, a slightly Absolutely. longer video. And some recipes Absolutely. too. Yeah, so that beautiful normalising effect, and yeah, let's get those recipes. Fantastic! Up as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's move on. Thank yeah, you very much. You. We'll go and see what else we can find. Lovely. So we've got some wild raspberries here. Um, still very green, unfortunately. They're not ripe yet. Um, otherwise I would be having a good feast on them. So here we have some angelica and beside it we have some hogweed. I used to get candied angelica which is bright green. I used to get it on cakes and ice biscuits and things. The flower heads are quite attractive for insects and hoverflies as you can see. Um, hogweed is too, but it's just past flowering now and that's the seed heads that you can see. Uh, but you have to be very careful uh, with hogweed and angelica. Um, so that hogweed is poisonous um, and you can get a nasty burn on your skin from the stems. Okay, so we've got some sorrel here. Um, sorrel's really lovely, it's got a nice citrusy flavour. I use it when I'm cooking fresh fish and it's also nice in a salad. When you see it flowering, it's got a nice red flower. 
there's a little bit here where there's a bit of the flower starting to come, but it's quite an attractive flower in the summertime. So we've got pineapple weed here, um, so it likes to grow in kind of rough waste ground. Um, if you give the, the leaves and the flowers a really good rub, like this, and smell them you get a hint of pineapple. So here we have yarrow, um, it flowers a bit later at this time of year. It's got these lovely feathery leaves and then the, the lovely clusters of the white. Sometimes you get pink uh, flowers on it too. I'm really glad we've found this one. We've been looking for a while, but we've not found the right sort of vegetation, the right sort mm -hmm. of soil where it grows. Um, it's it's much, much more prevalent in the Highlands and in the Orkney. Where you have a poorer soil, poorer so unreached. acidic soil very mm. often as well. And it's very hardy, it can tolerate quite exposed areas. It's called yarrow, um, Achillea millifolium. And the mm. millifolium bit means thousand, oh you've got one there, fantastic. Thousand leaves, and you can really see why. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? It's a thousand and folia. It's a leaf. leaf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And there's nothing else that really looks like it. It looks like a feather. Isn't it? So, yeah, absolutely beautiful. Um, the Achillea bit, it comes from a tradition relating to Achilles. And we've known about this plant as a wound herb, a wound healing herb, since the time of the ancient Greeks, at least. Um, and Achilles was a warrior, but because he was invulnerable, he couldn't be killed. He used to help his comrades mm -hmm. in battle tend their wounds. It stops blood flow. It helps arrest bleeding. Mm -hmm. Used internally and externally. And it's also a really nice aromatic herb in culinary use as well. Yeah, I do use it in in salads, but also I'm using a dried herb mm -hmm. and and flowers in my bitters. Mm -hmm. So okay. steep it in vodka or a strong strong alcohol and extract the bitterness and then ah. mix it with uh, other things to make it also the mixtures. Nice. Ah. Mm -hmm. I use it in, in salads at the at this stage when it's still pale nice and, fresh. and so ah, soft. Yeah, yeah. That's it's nice. still crunchy and mm -hmm. it's not that fibrous and you can use it in salads but also I use things like that in my ferments. It's also quite aromatic, bitter, good for digestion. It's associated with relaxant tea, it's associated with um, so being helpful for digestive problems, mm -hmm. associated with anxiety and stress. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yarrow. Well, here we've got a lovely little flower, which is called red shank. It's a really pretty little pink flower, but it really likes the shore of this loch, so there's quite a lot of it along the shoreline here. We have some lovely meadow sweet here, which has got a really nice smell. So we've got some sneezewort here, quite a pretty little flower. The leaves used to be used for snuff boxes. Um, other flowers that we've got in here, there's quite a bit of the meadow sweet at the back. Um, this lovely little purple flower here is self heal. And just behind it, there's some of the seed heads from yellow rattle. Um, we've also got red clover over here. And then down here, there's some eyebright. So it's a really good place to start if you're new to foraging. 
the common dandelion, which is actually a whole lot of different species, <laughs> subspecies, but it's called Taraxacum officinale, and sometimes you'll see written in brackets afterwards, ag. That just means it's an aggregate, so there's a lot of subspecies. It's called dandelion, there's lion's tooth, translates as, because of the shape of the, the leaves, very distinctive leaves. Most of the time. Some dandelion leaves look more like lettuce leaves. In fact, it's a very close cousin of lettuce. I'll try to find one here. You see it's less serrated, but still yes. quite distinctive. So the medicinal properties are abundant, as are their food properties. It's almost like a medicinal food, mm -hmm. in a way, because that, the boundary between the two is very blurred, isn't it? Food is your medicine. Food is medicine. Everything mm -hmm. you take into your body, food or drink, goes through the same mm -hmm. metab metabolic processes as, as uh, medicines. Um, so yeah, it all has an effect on your, on your system. Mm -hmm. um, dandelion leaves, well, the dand another nickname for dandelion in Scotland was pea de beds. Mm -hmm. And in French it was pisson lee. In many other countries it will have a nickname like that because it was used as a diuretic. It mm -hmm. wouldn't make you pee the bed. And you can make all sorts of things with the yellow parts of the flower head. You can make dandelion wine. I've tried your dandelion wine in the past, but I've also made some dandelion honey, which is a, a French rural speciality from the mountains close to the Swiss border. And we're foraging for fun, not only medicine Absolutely. and food, yeah. but also for things to play with. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'll show you the other one yeah. that you can Fantastic. make. And that's a dandelion whistle or dandelion trumpet. Snap That's it like that. Fun. You need to squash it. Fantastic. <laughs> so it's a... That's a great one. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, laughter is medicinal too. So yes, it is. <laughs> another therapeutic mm -hmm. property of the dandelion. <laughs> okay, so here, down here, we've got some dandelions. Um, so you've got the, the leaves here. And then luckily, we've got one in flower here. Early in the spring, dandelions are a really good source of pollen and nectar for insects, for bees and insects. A lot of people like to get rid of them in their gardens, but it's a good idea to leave a few dandelions for the wildlife. Um, once the flowers pass, you get the dandelion clocks. And we always used to play with the clocks when we were kids, blowing them to tell the time. Uh, but the seed heads are also an important food source for birds in your garden. so. I get quite a lot of um, green finches, uh, linnets and twite as well feeding on the, the, the seed heads. You quite often get red poles or goldfinches too. So it's really important to have them in your garden and leave them as a food source for the wildlife. Excellent. What a fantastic video. Brilliant. Thank you very much for, for that. That was fascinating. I was just thinking about the dandelions and, um, you know, speaking to my grandfather the other day about that, um, that I think, is it right that everything, you can eat dandelions, everything except for the stem. Is that right? That's about right. Yeah. But uh, as Shimon showed, you can uh, use the stem in other creative ways. <laughs> and we used to use the stem, the, the white latex, the sap from the dandelion stalk, um, used to be used traditionally throughout Scotland and most of Britain, especially in the springtime, to treat warts. Oh, so, right. yeah. Together with greater salandon. Salandon. What was that, Shimon? Sorry, I didn't it's catch that. Together with the sap of a greater salandin. Oh, yeah, greater salandin. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. I'll, I'll just say um, to our audience, that film will be available on the Orkney International Science Festival's YouTube channel for folk to watch again from about 4.30. So if you want to join um, and rewatch that video, you can do that from then. Fantastic. Well, um, Anna and Shimon, we've actually got some questions that have come in on our YouTube channel. Are you happy to answer a few questions from our audience? Sure. Excellent. Yeah. We've got until about quarter to three to answer the questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll begin. 
I'll begin there. Excellent. So we've got um, an interesting one here. Uh, good. Are there any a good a good starting question? I have to say, are there any books or resources that you would both recommend to identify plants and trees? Absolutely, um, Shimon. If you'd like to go first, maybe. Probably yeah. Richard Moby and Food for Free. That would be mm. the one to go for. But uh, at the moment, personally, I'm, I'm I'm not a book person when it comes to delving into into the environment. I usually go out, notice things, write things down, and then go home and research. And then usually just at the moment, I just go online and talk to people. Mm -hmm. But books, definitely, there are plenty more. And uh, obviously, you may be more specific and go into fungi and then plants and, and trees and stuff like that. So it's, it's yeah. yeah. Now that's that's a good point, Shimon. Um, I agree. It's uh, There are two things, I think, to take into account. One is there are some um, rules. We, we call them the three R's of foraging, so the, the rights and responsibilities and the risks as well. So there are some tips in the notes that we've put together to accompany the foraging walks. So it gives you a rough idea, just a very sort of... Um, brief outline of, of the how to go about foraging safely and sustainably. Um, if you're new to it, think of, you know, go and look at plants that you already know. Start there, dandelions, nettles, ducken, that sort of thing. Learn those, go on the walks that you enjoy and observe the plants throughout the year. There is nothing better, as Shimon says quite rightly, than getting your eye in, get to know the plants. They will be your friends. Um, it's, it's very true. There are some good books if you want to get a bit more uh, technical. So something like this, which I actually think is out of print at the moment, but it should there should be a new edition produced at some point soon, but you can still pick this up secondhand. It's fantastic for very clear descriptions of plants. And always remember you take the book to the, the, the plant rather than the plant to the book. So. Um, you're best leaving it in place. Take a photo and then do your research, as Shimon said. Um, and please do, yes, have a look at the notes. But bear in mind, this is something, foraging is something that humans and animals have always done. It's not rocket science. It is really easy to learn. But just take it step by step and you'll find um, you get to know the plants really well. Definitely. I, I would definitely encourage everyone just to go out and get immersed and feel comfortable. I think the first thing is to go out and feel comfortable in our natural environment and the rest comes next. Absolutely, yeah. Excellent, well thank you, thank you both for that one. Okay, um, um, I'll just also say, Anna, you said that you have those notes and for anybody listening, those will be available on the Orkney International Science Council website underneath um, Foraging the Old Road if you want to refer to those, fantastic. Okay, our next question, um, got a question asking, what compounds in elder is thought to be so effective and beneficial health-wise? That's a very interesting one because we're still not sure at all. Um, there has been some research done, but it's mainly been focused on um, whole berry extracts and um, products that have been produced. There's one, I think it's called Sambucol, which is widely sold in mainland Europe. As a, as a winter tonic. But um, I would be very interested to see a little bit more research done on the, on the compounds that potentially are the active constituents. But I think in general, it's what we often find with, with wild foods and medicines is that it's the whole plant. So taking an active constituent, you very often end up with something that is medicinally perhaps more potent or quicker to act, but you may also be um, taking out from that other compounds which um, may offset some negative um, effects too. So for example, um, if I'm, if this is not too much of a digression with dandelion, it's really interesting because we said in the video, it's called pee the bed. It's a very potent diuretic. And as such, it has been traditionally used to lower blood pressure, pretty much like a a diuretic tablet that you might get from your GP if your blood pressure is creeping up. Um, but very often with 
um, pharmaceutical diuretics. There are more modern ones now, but traditionally your GP would prescribe a mineral supplement to go along with it because the diuretic um, means that your urine formation is speeded up. So your kidneys and urinary system don't have as much time to do their job as a recycling plant for particularly for very important minerals and proteins that you, your body needs. So you can end up with a mineral deficiency. In dandelion, on the other hand, it is so rich in minerals that you have a net gain in minerals, particularly things like potassium, which are very essential, um, despite the diuresis. So very, very interesting. But if you were to take the active constituent, the diuretic constituent of dandelion, you'd miss out on all that, all the minerals which compensate for the loss of urine. And this similar picture is very much the case with other with other wild foods and medicines. So yeah. using using them in the traditional way can actually make a lot more sense. It's basically, we need to look at the bigger picture when uh, nature is going towards homeostasis and basically we are part of it. And basically, as Jana says, it's all complicated. Some things we don't understand yet and just isolating every component and trying to understand how they interact with each other, that's, that's probably would be the way to go rather than, than singling them out. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating stuff, you know. Oh, I feel I'm learning an awful lot here. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> okay, we'll uh, go on to our next question. Fabulous. Well, this, this um, harks back to our, our, initial, our initial question there. Um, this is someone who's saying, I'm very interested in foraging, but I'm also concerned about safety, especially poisoning. And this puts me off a bit. Do you have any tips? quite understandable. Do you have anything uh, to offer for this question? Yeah, I, I, there are, I would, do you mind, Anna? No I would definitely kind of start, there are no rule of thumb. There are no mm -hmm. rules of thumb when it comes to, for example, fungi. I mean, there are some, but for me, there is only one. If, if you're in doubt, just check it out. And definitely start learning when you, when you go into foraging, start learning poisonous plants first, rather than, mm -hmm. Obviously, learn the basic edibles like nettles and dandelions, but learn your poisonous plants first. But also, don't get don't get paranoid. They're usually very easy to identify, and uh, yeah, just don't get scared. Just learn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think that's very true. I mean, another risk that's associated with poisoning it's not just the poisonous plants or toxic plants, but also risks from um, so, for example, um, pesticides or from animal feces. So there are some basic steps that you can take just to, to be safe with those. Um, and that's it's, it's very easy to do. So please don't be scared. As we said earlier on, start with things that you know and just focus on those. Do a little bit of homework, uh, learn a bit more about how to identify them, what time of year they're at their best, um, that sort of thing. But it is, it is very easy. Once I'm just on the same topic, um, in the video, um, Megan mentioned hogweed and said that it was poisonous and it can give you nasty burns. It's actually quite an interesting one because the, the one that's more toxic or can give you nasty burns is the giant hogweed. Uh -huh. I don't think that is a problem in Orkney, um, although it is to some extent in parts of mainland Scotland. Um, it's, it's a big thug of a plant. It's a, considered a, a, an invasive non-native species, but it is actually quite risky to come in contact with the sap. Now the common hogweed isn't toxic at all. In fact, it's a very traditional food, particularly in parts of Eastern Europe, where it was called green borscht. Is that right, Shimon? It's called, uh, the name of the plant is called barscht. Barsh. And barsh is also the name of the soup that you're probably, some of you are aware of, it's borscht. So basically the name of the soup came from the plant that has been fermented for up to a week. And uh, you ended up with about, uh, you had a two fermentation processes going at the same time, lactin fermentation and alcohol fermentation. And I won't be going into detail now, but basically, as Joanna said, the plant is perfectly edible. However, and I, you might want to... A follow on on that there's a plant from the carrot family that contain furanocumarins. That's it, yeah, so, absolutely. Furanocumarins develop in the plant, particularly in strong ultraviolet light. It's one of the plant's protective mechanisms. 
And so if you've got a very hot summer or plants growing in an exposed area where there's lots of UV light, the chances are it may develop some of the properties, the foranocumulins that can give you a little bit of a burn. The, it's a, the burn happens by because your skin, the, the, the sap of the plant with the furanocoumarins in will make your skin sensitive to UV light and that will cause a blister, which can recur each time you go out in the sun. With common hogweed, it's much milder and much less likely to occur unless you're handling the plant a lot. Or With the giant hogweed, sorry? Or if you're silly enough like me two years ago and I did an experiment and I've tried <laughs> to see whether it affects your, your skin and it does. You can see that on my Instagram. Basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's just, a, just a burn. Mm -hmm. yeah. Come on, hold time. Yeah, thanks, Shimon. We have included some notes and links about for more information about the hogweed family, uh, the common hogweed and giant hogweed, with with the links to images that you can will help you identify them. And Shimon also has a little video on his website to help you identify them as well. So, um, and we've also got a recipe that you can use um, for the hogweed seeds, which are um, ripening as we speak. So there we go. Excellent. Thank you both. Okay, finish that question. Okay. Oh, another question here. Very, very worthwhile. Is there any, oh, excuse me. Is there a nationwide foraging club and or local clubs? Gosh, is there, is there anything um, that people could look up? Um, I'm, I'm a member of the Association of Foragers. So this is this is the place where you have a, a directory of uh, obviously that there are many there are many other foragers that are not within the association and there is there is no need to be part of it to be accredited or you know like Anna is not part uh, of the association and she's probably one of the greatest greatest foragers I know but uh, also the directory of the association of foragers can give you yeah. There are also lots of face group, Facebook groups mm -hmm. um, with people um, of varying degrees of expertise. Um, but it's a really good place to, there are some that are local and some that are national. So have a wee look on those. There, it's always good to have a chat. You can post photographs and people will respond. Um, be, be a little bit careful. Don't just go with the first response. There'll be usually somebody on there which will who will... Um, give you an accurate identification and some guidance about how to use it. But there are lots of groups out there. There are also some meetup groups which mm -hmm. go out um, sometimes with a forager to to you know take to lead a walk um, and introduce you to some plants in your local area. Yeah, it's uh, throughout the recent months uh, the, the interest in foraging really it's it's, it's picking up. People are really getting more and more interested. And I think uh, that's really good because that way we can start educate new generations of uh, people that will be rather than harvesters, they'll be stewards of nature. So that way we can, we can tend, tend to, to our ecosystems very well. Absolutely, yeah. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Okay, we've got um, a little bit more time still. We've got about sort of five minutes for more questions. We've got the next one here. What compound of hawthorn is beneficial and does it contain any trace elements? Aha, okay. Um, I'm trying, I'm racking my brains trying to remember here. Um, yeah, sh should have this at my fingertips because it is a science festival after all. <laughs> I can look it up and post something about it. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what the actual compounds are, but there are um, several which actually which um, have a relaxant effect on the cardiac circulation um, so hawthorn tea as lauren said in the video is is a is a relaxant um, but it also has a direct effect on the arterial circulation particularly so traditionally it's been used for um, for example people who have been lifelong smokers and who have um, arteriosclerosis, it's a difficulty walking because of hardening of the arteries in their legs um, and it can be quite effective for that but it is quite a potent um, medicine so not something to be taken lightly if you are already on medication for a cardiac condition. I mean a cup of hawthorn tea 
um, occasionally is absolutely fine. But if you're wanting to treat yourself for uh, using something like Hawthorne um, for blood pressure or for atherosclerosis, you do need to, to take some professional advice to be safe with that. Um, I will check up on the active constituents and maybe I could post some of those details of those somewhere. Um, I'm sorry, I can't ask the answer the question off the top of my head just now. <laughs> Do you will... mind if I'll just mention something? Anna? I don't think you should be feeling bad. I think the way the way I look at these things is to have an understanding that there are compounds and there is a lot of research that has been done online. And as long as you have an understanding that you need to research it, a lot of knowledge is available free online and you can you can go into scientific papers. So if someone is interested in that, I'm pretty sure that uh, they can wait for Anna to prepare that and, and, and upload it. And Anna is usually very good at that, but uh, there's plenty of research online and it's almost impossible to remember everything as well. Yeah, if you if you go on to um, there's a, a website called PubMed, which collects um, all sorts of scientific research papers. So you'll be able to read abstracts if you if you put in the scientific name for Hawthorne, which is Crataegus monogyna. There are several other species which uh, which are present in Europe and the Middle East, but monogyna is the species that's most common in Scotland, most of mainland UK. Um, and you will find um, lists of some of the so research papers on some of the actu actual constituents of Hawthorne and their medicinal uh, properties, their active um, th their actions on the on the, the, the body. Well, excellent, thank you. Fantastic. Hopefully, um, we'll be able to find a way um, to to share more information at a later time. Fabulous. Oh, I've got another question about hawthorn here. Um, um, we've got a question asking, are hawthorn leaves edible as a salad ingredient? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But you better get in early because um, in, after about maybe two or three weeks, they start to develop um, tannins. Um, so again, one of the plant's defenses against herbivores, um, against being eaten basically. Um, and also um, they become quite bitter and tough. They're quite leathery. So get in there early. There are many tree species whose leaves are edible early in the spring before they develop these, the strong tannins um, that, that make them really indigestible. That's, that's correct. Many, many of, the, of the young leaves like uh, Hawthorne or my daughter's favorite beech that beech. tastes like sorrel, uh, just, just before they, they become like a green, they're very green when they're still pale and, and soft, they're usually at the, the good stage. And uh, Megan mentioned, and Anna, you said that they used to be called bread and cheese. Is that right? That's right, yeah. It's, it's parts of England rather than Scotland where it's called that, but it's, it's a nice indication of how it was used. Mm -hmm. I love these little glimpses you get about, uh, you know, of how people used plants in the past. So something like bread and cheese, it's, it's such a, they're both mm. sort of staple foods. So the idea that children and adults would forage, would nibble on bread and cheese on the, on the way home or, you know, when they were outdoors is, is, is great. It's great fun. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. We've, we've not got very long left, I'm afraid. Ah, but um, we've got time for maybe one very quick question. Um, so apologies for everyone who's asked a question that we aren't able to answer today, um, but we've got, a, uh, we'll finally end on a question about the sorrel. Is sorrel rich in vitamin C? It is, yes. Sorrel is very rich in vitamin C and it's also got a range of other minerals as well. Um, the key ingredient that gives it its um, tart, lemony taste is actually oxalic acid. Um, which is absolutely fine. Oxalic acid occurs very widely in the plant kingdom. Um, it, too much of it can be a little bit harmful, particularly if you have a history of kidney stones. It can bind to other minerals and cause problems. Um, but in, in moderate use in normal cooking um, or salads, well, that sort of thing, it's not going to do you any harm at all. So. Excellent. I think we'll just end there. So thank you so much, Anna and Shimon, for everything. What a fascinating discussion. I've really enjoyed, uh, I've really enjoyed this. Fantastic. 
Um, and thank you to everybody at home. Thank you so much for sending in your questions and your comments. And I'm sorry we didn't manage to get through everybody's, but thank you so much for participating. Um, and also a quick thank you to all of our invisible tech team. Um, we've got Freya, Reina, John, Kathleen and Eric. So thank you so much for all your support. Um, it's vital to, for this to go ahead. Our next talk for the Foraging Festival will be at 3 p.m. So you've not got long time for a cup of tea. Um, Foraging Fish and Fife Coast Trails with chef and food writer Wendy Barry. So looking forward to that at 3 p.m. And if you are enjoying the festival, please feel free to donate to the um, and full details of that are on the Orkney International Science Festival website. And please do like us on Facebook and follow the YouTube channel. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank and thank you to everybody who's participated. Bye-bye.